Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about health care topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Hello and welcome. Today's presentation, Wound Care, the Latest Treatment Options, is presented by Dr. Prasad Kilaru, the Medical Director of the Washington Center for Wound Healing and Hyperbaric Medicine. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Prasad Kilaru. Hi, thank you all for joining the live stream. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Washington Hospital for setting up this opportunity. So just a little background, I'm uh, Prasad Kilaru. I'm one of the plastic surgeons here at Washington Hospital in Fremont. And we have a wound care center here in Fremont that's been open for the last 14 years and in our new location for the last nine months. Wound care is a huge topic, right? There are um, one year, two year fellowships going into details about wound care. What I wanted to do was give an overview about wound care, some basic information on how wounds develop, how they heal, what we can do to prevent them, and also an idea as to what the costs are associated with having these wounds and the risks associated with them. And more importantly, how to prevent them from coming once uh, we were able to heal the wounds. What is a wound? Well, Webster's Dictionary defines wound as an injury to the body that typically involves a laceration or a breakdown of the membrane with damage to the underlying tissues. That's a very fancy way to say it, but at the end of the day, it's an open wound in the skin. Depending on the size and location, we classify it as different stages. So a stage one ulcer is basically an ulcer that is involving, not even through the skin, a little bit of redness in the skin area here. Stage two, going through with the partial thickness of the skin. Stage three, going through the skin into the fat underneath it, but the muscle and bone is, a, is stable. And stage four is when the, the injury goes all the way through the skin in, in involving the muscle and bone and such. Now, wounds can typically be divided into acute wounds and chronic wounds. Luckily, most of the wounds are what we call an acute wound, either after an injury or after surgery. Whereas the chronic wounds are the wounds that have been there for a long period of time and there's some problem that's preventing it from healing properly. And by definition, if a wound's been there for more than six weeks, we consider that a chronic wound. So this is an example of an acute wound. You can see there is a cut in the skin. This is a young patient of mine that cut himself. We put stitches in, it heals after a couple of weeks, no issues. Whereas this is a chronic wound and you can see the color of the wound, it's much more pale, not as healthy looking. If you look at here, nice pink, good blood supply. Whereas this wound, you don't see that as much and you can see areas where there are new wounds also starting to form. So the acute wound healing is a pretty regulated cascade and it follows a set pattern. You have hemostasis where basically the bleeding initially stops, then we go through the inflammatory phase and proliferative phase and remodeling phase, which is how the scar forms and the scar matures. Whereas with the chronic wound, that normal process isn't working properly. For most of these wounds, there is a balance between the wound healing and the collagen forming and the wound breaking down. And if that balance is not working properly, then you have problem wounds. So if there's too much wound breakdown, you get a chronic wound. If there's too much scar buildup, then you get a hypertrophy or keloid scar. So they're both the two ends of the same spectrum as far as the wound healing process goes. So with wound failure, it's not one thing. It's usually a combination of a bunch of things that comes together. So you have infection, you have ischemia or poor blood supply, not enough oxygen, recurrent injuries, same injury happening over and over again, and cellular failure, like in situations like diabetes, all of these come together to form what we call chronic inflammation, and that results in a problem wound. There are lots of, kind of, lots of different types of problem wounds, right? The three common ones are associated with pressure, bed sores or pressure ulcers, venous ulcers, and diabetic ulcers. So pressure ulcers or bed sores are very common in older debilitated patients. We see them anywhere from two to 10% of patients that are in the hospital and up to a quarter of the patients that are in long-term facilities like nursing homes can develop bed sores. Uh, 
and they can be expensive. A single bed sore can add up to $20,000 to a hospital stay because of prolonged stay or additional treatment that's required. Venous ulcers are usually ulcers that develop on the legs. They're related to poor circulation. And unfortunately, they have a very high recurrence rate. So even if we treat them, they tend to come back very frequently. And I'll go into more detail about each of these in a little bit. Now, diabetes is the biggest culprit. And if there's nothing else you take away from this lecture, just remember, diabetes is bad. And if you can fix it, that's the best thing that you can do. So about 2 million new cases are seen in the US every year. And we have almost 27 million people, about 8% of the population, that are diabetic. The majority are diagnosed, but there's also a significant chunk, as you can see, about 8 million people that are undiagnosed. And given our obesity epidemic, there's another huge population that are pre-diabetic. And unfortunately, as we all know, African Americans, Hispanics, Latinos, Native Americans have a higher incidence of developing diabetes. There's also a huge cost associated with the diabetes. The direct cost is almost $100 billion. Majority of that is in, in care of diabetes or its complications, but there's also a significant amount in that diabetics have a higher likelihood of developing strokes, heart attacks, vascular problems, all these other things, and all those costs also add up. Now, as I mentioned, almost 19 million people are known diabetic, and about 15% of them will develop an ulcer on their leg during their lifetime. And the majority of those can potentially progress to worsening conditions. In fact, the majority of the amputations that occur in, in patients usually start off with a foot ulcer, and then they progress on to needing an amputation because they're not taken care of properly and such. About 85, 86,000 amputations are done every year in patients who have diabetes. So again, going back to the cost, if you have an ulcer in a diabetic, it's about $8,000 to take care of it. If you have an ulcer in a non-diabetic, it's about $2,000 to take care of it. So diabetes in and of itself kind of makes it much harder to treat. If it's infected, it almost triples the cost. And if it gets to the point where it's bad enough that we end up needing an amputation, you can see there's a significant increase in the cost associated with that as well. Now, the next two slides are, in my mind, the scary slides as it relates to diabetes. The lifetime risk of getting a foot ulcer in a diabetic, as I mentioned, is about 15%. But if you get to the point where you need an amputation, it very negatively affects your survival rate. So the three-year survival rate in somebody who has an amputation is about 50%. And the five-year survival rate is only about 40%. And again, the chance of getting or needing an amputation in the other leg is up to 40% in three years and goes over 50% in five years. To give you an idea, if you look at the mortality areas in these different disease processes, so the blue is five-year and the yellow is one year, and you can see breast cancer, 20% at five years, Colon cancer, 55% at five years. Diabetes, 70%. Lung cancers, 72%. So diabetes is worse than getting colon cancer or lung cancer or breast cancer, and is almost comparable to getting lung cancer. So it's very important that we address this and treat this aggressively, because if not, it can be very dangerous. There are a lot of things that make a wound slow to heal. Some of it is common sense. Main one is nutrition. If you're not having enough protein or calories, you know, I tell my patients, if there's not enough gas in the car, it's not gonna go anywhere. And then we need other things like vitamins and minerals uh, to make sure that wounds heal properly. Tissue hypoxia, fancy way to say that we need to have enough blood going to the area where the problem is, we need to make sure there's enough oxygen going to the area where the problem is. If there's infection, if there are metabolic conditions like diabetes or renal failure, if there's cancer, if there is immune problems, somebody's on chemotherapy or on steroids or other issues where their immune system is not working properly, that can also increase the chance of a wound not healing in a timely fashion. And then the mechanical problems we see, especially with uh, bed sores, which is pressure, repetitive injuries, friction, things like that. And then we have some other, thankfully less common conditions like radiation therapy uh, and other wound problems. The principle for wound management in and of itself is pretty simple. We find the cause, treat the cause, provide support for the entire person, provide a good environment locally for it to heal. 
right? That sounds very simple, but it gets complicated when we look at all the things that prevent the wound from healing properly. So Ambrose de Paris was uh, a French surgeon, and he had this in one of the books that he wrote, in that he dresses the wound, but God heals it. Uh, I joke with my patients, I tell them, you know, the patient and the God does the work and I take the credit for it, but a lot of it is supporting the patient while the body does the work in getting this to heal. So how do we support the patient? So first step, like I said, nutrition. We want to make sure they're getting adequate calories, adequate uh, protein, because those are the building blocks to, to heal a wound. But we need, also need vitamins and minerals. So in patients that have poor healing, vitamin C is something that we use a lot. Vitamin uh, A, especially if somebody's on steroids, zinc is a, is a mineral supplement that usually is lacking that prevents the wound from healing properly. So those are things that we monitor and check. We check the nutrition status, what their protein levels are, what their blood count levels are, and if need be, we supplement it, whether it's with oral supplements like Ensure or sometimes even giving them something through the IV or through a feeding tube or whatnot to kind of improve their circulation, uh, improve their nutrition. The second big thing is we want to control the infection. A lot of these wounds, when they've been around for a while, they develop a chronic infection or what we call colonization. So it's not a rip-roaring, everything is red and swollen and pussy, but the uh, bacteria are in the wound, there are enough bacteria in the wound, it's preventing the wound from healing properly. So sometimes correcting that is important. In diabetics, we get what we call a polymicrobial. Fancy way to say that there are multiple different types of bug that are growing in, bugs that are growing in the same wound. So sometimes a single antibiotic is not enough to take care of it, we may have to use multiple antibiotics. If the wound's been there for a long time, if we, or if you get to that stage four I was talking about earlier, you can have infection for the underlying bone. Unfortunately, bone has poor blood supply. So the antibiotics we give, or the medication we're taking, may not get to the tissue in adequate concentrations to kill the problem. So we need to be able to identify that so that we can treat it aggressively, whether it's with surgery or with more specific dressings in the area that we're treating. And once we've taken care of the infection and taken care of the nutrition, Circulation. We need to make sure there's enough blood going to the tissue. So we have two types of circulation. There is blood that is being brought from the heart to wherever the problem is, and the arteries do that. And there is blood and fluid that's taken from the heart, or from that tissue back up to the heart, and the veins and the lymphatic system uh, does that. So we need to address and evaluate both of those. So we look to make sure that there's adequate blood coming down to the, t to the tissue. And we have specific testing like angiograms or MRAs that we use to evaluate to make sure there's adequate blood coming down. And if there isn't, depending on where the problem is, just like they do with the heart, we can do angioplasty, which is to open up the blood vessels, or place stents in, which are little tubes to keep the blood vessels open, or even bypass the area of blockages and things like that. On the venous side, if the veins aren't working, the blood can't get back up to the heart, it's pooling in the leg, causing leg swelling. So anything we can do to control that swelling, improve that blood flow back to the heart is key in uh, preventing these ulcers from happening or at least treating them. And then once we've kind of taken care of the underlying problem, then locally we got to do something to get the wound to heal. The function of addressing is to provide an optimal healing environment for the wound. And depending on where the wound is, there are different needs for the wound. So you have an initial injury, there's a wound, the wound is infected, it's red, it's swollen, it's tender. So at that time, we have to use a dressing that kills bacteria, that eats up the dead tissue. Once the wound cleans up, then we want to use something that will prevent it from drying out. Or if it's too wet, we want to use something that will keep it um, so that it's not too moist and damaging the tissue around it. So there are lots of factors that determine which dressing to use. Um, location of where the wound is, how much drainage there is, what's the uh, status of the surrounding tissue, how painful is it, um, is the wound infected or not, what's the ability of the person giving, uh, providing the care. Sometimes it's very simple where you just put a little uh, ointment on and that's it, we're done. Sometimes it's a much more complicated dressing where we have to have a nurse come home to do the dressings or even come to the hospital to get the dressings done. And then finally, how expensive is it? Some of these dressings are great, but they can be very expensive and if they're not covered by insurance, then we have to look at other ways to, to provide coverage for those wounds. Along the same lines, when we, once we have a wound, if the wound's not perfect, we want to kind of get it ready, prepare it to allow it to heal. So debridement is one of the things we do. Again, fancy way to, to say that we're going to cut out tissue. We remove any dead or infected tissue. The most common way we do that is with 
surgical debridement. Basically, you take a knife or a scissors and cut out the area that doesn't look healthy. If it's a small area, something that we can usually do at the bedside in the clinic. Uh, if it's a larger area or it's very painful, then we end up having to take the patient to the operating room um, to do that. Mechanical debridement is basically using any area that's a little bit um, rough, such as um, in the bathtub or in the shower, let the water kind of get rid of some of the scabs, some of the areas that are stuck together. Um, enzymatic degradement is again one of the dressings that we use. It's a certain type of ointment which has an enzyme in it which breaks down collagen or breaks down dead tissue so that it's a little bit slower but it's less painful, less invasive than, than some of these other measures that we were talking about. And then finally once the wound is clean and healthy, one option we have, especially for some of the chronic wounds, is to surgically close the wound. Unfortunately, not all wounds are um, appropriate to close. Sometimes we have to let them heal by themselves. But if they're appropriate to close, there are different ways in which we can close them. Uh, we can do a skin graft, the wound superficial. If it's a deeper wound, we can do more extensive surgeries. And as I mentioned earlier, if the circulation is not adequate, there's reconstructive surgeries that we can do to improve the circulation. And if all those don't work, especially in the extremities, sometimes an amputation is what we end up having to do. An amputation is not always a failure. If we have somebody that left alone may end up with an amputation above the knee, but we're able to salvage it where we're only having to take one or two toes, but we're still allowing the patient to walk, uh, um, then in my mind that's a save because we're still maintaining their quality of life. We're still allowing them to do everything that they want to and be able to do. And then in the wound clinic, one of the things we offer is we have more advanced therapies that a typical doctor's office or a typical uh, nursing home would not necessarily have. So these are the biologic dressings. These are manufactured dressings that have been shown to increase uh, the ability for some of these chronic wounds to heal. So the product we use a lot are what's called a bioengineered human dermal substitute, which is basically human skin and that's been grown in a lab and it's been shown to increase the production of growth factors that allow tissues to heal uh, fast. So Apograph and Dermograph are two products that we use a lot. They're approved for use for diabetic foot ulcers and some of the venous ulcers, so we use those in those situations. There are other products as well that in specific situations that we can use. So Graphix and Epifix are two products where the tissue is actually uh, harvested from amnion, human amnion, which is the area where the, that's kind of feeding the baby, the placenta. Uh, xenografts are grafts that we get from uh, animals. So oasis is something we get from pigs, and we also get tissue from cows, depending on what it is. And then there's some other products. Uh, we have Integra, which is actually a collagen-based product, and we have uh, various growth factors that we use depending on what the needs are. So depending on the problem that we're trying to fix, we have a whole plethora of options that we can use to fix those. And then finally, the coup de gras is uh, hyperbaric oxygen. So hyperbaric oxygen is a very effective treatment in tissues there where there's a lack of oxygen or where there's chronic infection that doesn't seem to be going away. And basically what we do is we provide oxygen at a high pressure in a concentrated setting, which has been shown to improve healing and also uh, allow us to avoid amputations in, in situations that otherwise would end up needing an amputation. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. So the chronic ulcers that we typically see, as I mentioned, are the pressure ulcers, venous ulcers, diabetic ulcers, and they account for about 70% of all the ulcers that we see. Each one of these costs more than a billion dollars annually as far as the amount of money that is spent uh, in hospital care and, and uh, subsequently. And unfortunately, most of these are preventive. So part of my goal is to try to educate uh, patients to make sure that they catch this early or if they, ca if they already developed the wound, how to prevent it from coming back. So pressure ulcer bed sores are ulcers that are associated with pressure. Um, basically, there are an er multiple areas of pressure where the bone is pushing up against the skin, and if you're laying on a hard surface, um, the pressure develops between the bone and uh, the, the hard surface, and the skin and or muscle in between it uh, gets compressed. Now, we found that as little as two hours in a position can cause a pressure ulcer to develop. Thankfully, our bodies have inbuilt mechanisms, reflexes that we don't even have to think about, where if you're sitting in a chair, you're unconsciously moving from side to side, you're uh, adjusting your weight. If you are sleeping, you're rolling, moving from side to side, adjusting your weight, so you're not 
putting pressure in any one area for a prolonged period of time. But we have patients that are paraplegic where their reflex, uh, their sensation is not there, so the reflex isn't being activated. Or some of our older, sicker patients that are in the ICU or, or have had a stroke that can't move. So those reflexes aren't working, so when the pressure develops, they can progressively get worse to the point where the skin breaks down. And as the skin breaks down, the muscle underneath it uh, and the tissue underneath it can also die and the ulcer can get bigger and bigger. And this is just a, a idea, depending on where the patient is laying, you can have pressure ulcers on the shoulders, on the hips, um, on the elbows, on the back, buttock, if you're sitting in the buttock area, the heels. So any area where you're putting pressure for too long a period of time can cause uh, an ulcer to develop. Now the treatment is, again, being very aggressive with these because the longer we wait, the, the deeper it gets, the worse it gets. So aggressively debriding any tissues that's not healthy. If, especially in the paraplegics, they can have muscle spasm. So that friction that I had talked about earlier and the repetitive injury can be a problem. So controlling the muscle spasm, controlling the infection, cleaning up the wounds and trying to close them as, as quickly as possible is always the first choice. As I mentioned, most of these ulcers are preventable. Um, in the ideal situation, in the hospital, we move the patients every two hours. We change them from one side to the other so they're not laying in any one position for too long a period of time. That's not always feasible. Um, one of the other big things that happens is, unfortunately, a lot of these patients, because of the paraplegia and whatnot, may also be incontinent. So if they're laying in their urine or laying in their stool, if they have problems with skin hygiene, and usually they're not eating well, so the nutrition's poor. So you have this conglomeration of all of these things that kind of come together and create a perfect strong. So we want to try to address each and all, uh, all of those areas to make sure their hygiene's good, their nutrition's good, that we're you know, changing their diaper or whatnot on a regular basis so you're not having soilage and things. So if we're able to do all that, then it's less likely for the pressure ulcer to come back. But if you're not able to do that, then there's a high chance that the ulcer can come back. Venous ulcerations, as I mentioned again, are a large part of what we see. Very high recurrence rate because the problem is blood's coming down to the foot okay, but the blood's not being taken back up from the foot back to the heart. So the blood pools in the leg, foot swells up. And when the foot swells up, the distance that the blood has to travel from the blood vessel to the skin gets larger. And so there's not, a, not as much blood gets to the very ends and that part breaks down. That's kind of a simple way to explain how the ulcer forms. So by putting compression, squeezing all that blood out, we get it to heal. But if we don't treat the underlying swelling, the infection and the breakdown comes back again. So I tell my patients, it's very key, very important that they wear compression stockings, try to keep their leg elevated, do anything and everything that they can to prevent this from coming back. And unfortunately, this is something they have to do for the rest of their life. Right? There's not a, okay, I do it for three months or six months and it goes away. No, it's something you got to do for the rest of your life. Diabetic ulcers, again, as I mentioned, are the biggest culprits because those are the ones that tend to um, get worse much quicker than the venous and pressure ulcers do. The venous and pressure ulcers tend to kind of stay where they are, whereas the diabetic ulcers tend to progress much more rapidly. And again, unfortunately, a lot of these patients who have venous ulcers are overweight, so they have associated diabetes or they're, you know, they have multiple comorbidities. They're never in silos. They, they kind of happen all together. Um, chronic foot ulcers, leading cause of amputation in diabetic patients. Um, there is a triad or you know, a combination of three things. Poor blood flow, poor sensation and infection. So diabetics, because of the neuropathy, a lot of them don't have sensation. So I have seen patients in the wound clinic, they come in, they take their shoe off and there is an insulin needle stuck in their foot and they have not felt it. Or they take their shoe off and there is a, you know, a marble sized rock in their shoe that they hadn't paid attention for and they've been walking on it for the whole day. And next thing you know, that's enough to break down the skin. And they have a shoe with the sock on, all kinds of bugs in it, that open wound now gets infected. So it's very quick for these things to progress. There are a bunch of other factors that are unique to diabetics. You have, diabetics have a higher tendency to develop a collapse of the arch. So if you look at the foot, there's an arch to the foot and that arch tends to collapse over time. So when, when we talk about flat feet, that's the arch collapsing, much more common in diabetics. And when that happens, you have areas that aren't normally used to seeing pressure, seeing pressure, and that causes those areas to break down. 
And if you have poor blood sugar control, that increases the likelihood of infection. It increases the likelihood that the arch collapse and all these, the neuropathy and all these other things happen as well. So again, this is an example that earlier picture that I showed you. This wound, you can see this is not the typical wound. The edges are very calloused. This is not a typical location where we see pressure, but because there's collapse, you're seeing pressure in this area as well. So how do we treat this? Again, this is a recurring theme. You want to be very aggressive with the treatment when we see an ulcer. Going and cutting out all of the tissue that's not healthy, getting down to healthy tissue, controlling infection, um, if need be, closing the wound. So the, the diabetic ulcers are some of the ones where you use the advanced skin therapies much more frequently, the aplograft, the dermograft, the hyperbaric oxygen treatment, things like that. Part of what we do is also offloading, making sure that there's no pressure where there shouldn't be. Having a good podiatrist makes a huge difference because you want to make sure that when you're walking, you're putting pressure on the foot where it's supposed to be. And if you don't have the proper shoes or the foot's not working properly, then you can make shoes or podiatrists can make shoes that will allow for that pressure to be distributed to where it's supposed to be um, so that we're not having uh, areas that aren't used to seeing pressure, developing pressure, and then developing uh, an ulcer with them. So with the diabetics, we always have a multidisciplinary approach. Every diabetic foot ulcer, we make sure a podiatrist sees them, make sure a vascular surgeon sees them to make sure that their circulation is okay, make sure that they have the proper footwear and such, because it's no use to heal a wound if we don't take care of the underlying problem because they'll be back within two months or six months with the same problem. So as I mentioned, we want to make sure that their circulation is good. We always have them see a vascular surgeon. We want to make sure that they have good foot care. So if they have fungal infections in their feet, if they have uh, poor nails, if they have poor shoes that don't work, either too tight or too loose, those all can be problems. Um, and we also want to make sure their blood sugar is uh, well controlled. There are lots of studies that have shown that if your sugars are fluctuating quite a bit or if they're consistently high, then you are at a much higher risk for developing uh, retinopathy, neuropathy, all of these other problems, and also increased risk for uh, immune problems where your white blood cells, which normally fight infection, don't work as well. Right? So it, it sounds simple, but we want to make sure that your sugars are controlled and that they're stable, consistent, so you're not seeing the fluctuations that you might otherwise see. Going back to what I mentioned earlier, hyperbaric oxygen treatment is one of our go-tos for some of the more complicated wounds. Basically what we do is we take a patient, we put them in a chamber that's at a higher oxygen pressure. So we'll go back to a little bit of physics, high school physics. Uh, at room air, at sea level, uh, the pressure that we're feeling normally is about one atmosphere or 760 millimeters mercury. Um, room air has about 20% oxygen and about 78, 80% nitrogen. What we do with hyperbaric oxygen is we take the patient, we put them in a chamber and we double the pressure. So we go up to two atmospheres and we give 100% oxygen as opposed to 20% oxygen. So you're getting five times the oxygen at twice the pressure. So technically you're getting 10 times the oxygen. So you have 10 times the oxygen dissolved in the blood and that increased pressure pushes that uh, oxygen out. If you remember, I told you before, you have the blood vessel here and as the leg swells, the distance it has to travel is greater, but with the increased pressure, the oxygen can go that extra distance also. So it's been shown to help heal those um, difficult wounds. And what we've shown is that with the hyperbaric oxygen treatment, you increase blood flow to the tissue. It actually creates new blood vessels in areas where there isn't new blood vessels. It increases the collagen formation. For some of these chronic infections, as I mentioned earlier, the bone does not have good blood supply. So by using hyperbaric oxygen treatment, we can treat bone infections by increasing the amount of oxygen going there. That oxygen by itself kills the bacteria but also improves the blood flow to the area where the blood supply is poor. So this is the chamber. This is what's called a single chamber. Um, so one person goes into the chamber. We have actually a TV with a DVD player so they can watch movies and what have you. Uh, each treatment is about 90 minutes. Um, and we use diving terminology. So if you think about when you go diving underwater, as you go deeper underwater, the water pressure kind of builds up and puts pressure on the body. So when we go to two atmospheres pressure, that's similar to diving to about 33 feet underwater. So we use the dive terminology. So we, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes to dive to the depth, which is the two atmospheres pressure. 
Treatment's typically about 90 minutes, and then it takes another five minutes to kind of come back up. So it's about a two hour treatment. Um, we do this every day, five days a week. And we do that uh, for anywhere from 30 to 40 treatments, depending on the um, disease process that we're trying to treat. So for infections, uh, ulcers, diabetic ulcers, typically it's about 30, 40 treatments. Uh, we also use this to treat uh, radiation injuries. So if somebody's had radiation therapy for cancer and they have problems with wounds or problems with uh, radiation damage to the bladder or to the bowel or even to the uh, mouth and jaw, things like that, the hyperbaric oxygen treatment helps in um, uh, healing those type of uh, problems. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, it's very effective in preventing amputation. So I can think of several patients of my own that I've had over the past few years that we thought, okay, for sure, this person is going to need an amputation, and we've been able to salvage uh, extremities that we otherwise would not have been able to. In COVID times, we've been seeing a lot of delay in care, especially you know March through May, June. Um, we have had patients who... Uh, came to the emergency room with ruptured appendices as opposed to, uh, you know, abdominal pain or patients who came in with a stroke as opposed to mini strokes or a heart attack as opposed to angina. Um, so our message is we don't want to delay care. All the hospitals and especially Washington Hospital have taken all the, all the necessary precautions, the CDC guidelines, even above and beyond the CDC guidelines as far as what we need to do to make sure that the patients that come to the hospital are safe, not only in the emergency room or the hospital setting, but also in the outpatient setting. And, and we want to make sure that they come in for care because as I've shown, the longer you wait, the deeper the ulcer becomes, the, the more difficult it is to treat, the longer it takes for it to heal. So you want to try to get, uh, get in to be seen as quickly as possible. As I mentioned, you know, we say if a wound's been there for six weeks, we consider that a chronic wound. But you don't necessarily have to wait six weeks to come in to be seen, right? If you have any of the comorbidities, diabetes, poor circulation, swelling in the legs, um, age, any of those things, come in sooner and we can get started sooner and, and do the appropriate treatment so that we're able to get there faster. And I apologize, I'm going to show a slightly graphic uh, picture, but just to kind of drive home what we're talking about. So this was a patient, 40-something-year-old patient that came in, had this little ulcer, had it for about a week or 10 days, didn't think much of it, his sugars weren't being controlled well, came in to see what's going on, and you can see, here is the wound. But we saw this and we said, okay, this is infected, we need to go take care of it. And then to, when we went to cut out all the infected tissue, you can see almost half of the foot had to be removed because all of that was infected. That's how diabetes is. It's usually the tip of the iceberg. So we aggressively went and cut all of that tissue out, then we did dressing changes, local care, you can see the pink is good, more healthy tissue coming up. And then we eventually went to do a skin graft, took skin from his thigh and used that to kind of cover up the area. Now, this is an example of what I was talking about. So normally you see an arch that goes up like this and you can see his arch is collapsed. So when he's walking, he's putting more pressure here than he should and that is going to cause him to break down that area again. So we had him go see podiatry, we had to have him get uh, special shoes to prevent that from, um, uh, from breaking down. And he, did, and he did really well for about three years. And three years later, the shoe got tight, he couldn't get back to getting it uh, to be seen, he was busy with work, da da da, and long story short, about a year after that, he developed an ulcer three years later, about a year after that, he ended up with a, above knee, uh, with a baloney amputation. So, all of these chronic wounds, they're a lifetime commitment. So just because we heal them once doesn't mean that they won't come back again. So just a few words about uh, our wound care center, Washington Center for Wound Healing and Hyperbaric Medicine. It's a multidisciplinary clinic. We have plastic surgery, vascular surgery, podiatry, infectious disease, emergency physicians all work there. We work in conjunction with the primary care physician. So we're always in communication. Any notes we write, we send back to the primary care. So they're in the loop as far as what's going on and, and what they need to do. Uh, we get the consults as needed. We have the resources of Washington Hospital. So we have infectious disease, uh, lymphedema clinic, physical therapy, diabetes, um, you know, any specialty that's needed, we're able to provide. One of the nice things that we do with the wound clinic is we take serial photographs and serial measurements. So every time patients come to the clinic, even if we see them twice a week, 
we take a picture, we measure the wound. So we have a, a visual documentation as to how the wound is progressing. And we have protocols for every type of wound. Um, so we have an idea that, okay, a wound should, it should decrease by 50% in a four week period. And if it doesn't, okay, what's the next step? How do we break down? What do we do next? Um, do we go back and look at circulation? Do we go back and check a culture? Do we go back and, and biopsy to make sure there's not anything else going on? So that helps keep us on track to make sure that we're able to heal the wound in a timely manner. We have an excellent training staff. As I mentioned, we have a whole bunch of doctors, but I would say I'm more proud of our nurses. Uh, most wound centers have one wound certified nurse among them. We have six and I would have any one of them treat me on any given day. They're very dedicated and they're the ones that, that do the yeoman's work, right? We come in, say hello, hi, uh, but they're the ones who take the dressings down, put the dressings back on and, and make sure that the care is being provided. They're the ones that teach the patients, teach the family how to do the care. So we have an amazing team that does that. And as I mentioned, we have Washington Hospital and all the resources of Washington Hospital behind us as well, which, which makes our job a lot easier. We do what we call failure mode analysis. Failure mode analysis is basically looking at a problem and saying, okay, usually by the time they come to see us, the patients have had a wound for two weeks, two months. I had a patient who came in a wound for eight years. It took us a year to heal the wound, but there's been something that's preventing the wound from healing. So our job is to figure out why is the wound not healing and what can we do to correct it? So first we look back and see what was done so far. So we're not repeating the same mistakes. And we see, okay, where are the holes that weren't filled? And we fill those holes and then progress on. So again, the documentation where we're looking at the wounds, measuring them so we can see, okay, are they getting better? Are they getting worse? What worked, what didn't work and moving on. Um, evaluating the wounds on a regular basis. So if something's been working for a while, but then it stops. We go back and see, okay, did it get infected now? Did the graft that we opened up get blocked again? The, so all of these things we keep checking on a regular basis. And at every visit, we're telling our patients, educating them on how to prevent this wound from happening, talking about frequent position changes, talking about leg elevation, compression, diabetes care, all those kind of things. And as I mentioned, we have all of the resources that uh, Washington Hospital brings to bear. So we are able to do uh, what we call total contact cast, which is a special kind of cast that, that helps with offloading. We're able to use a lot of the bioengineered skin substitutes, which are very expensive for a private office or a private practice to do, but the hospital is able to provide that, uh, those services. And again, hyperbaric oxygen treatment. We have the reconstructive therapy. We have three vascular surgeons, two plastic surgeons that that are able to help with any reconstruction that's, that's uh, needed. So this is our full-time group of physicians that are on the rotation. We also have several other physicians that help in coverage and we have the 400 members of Washington Hospital that we can call upon depending on what our needs are. So, I, I mean, I would like, I'm proud to say that you know, we've had the wound center at our new location for the last nine years. Um, we've partnered with a national organization for a while and we were beating their benchmarks on a consistent basis. And over the last few years, we've kind of stepped out on our own and we've done even better as far as benchmarks goes, time to healing, the rate of healing and such. So in summary, there are multiple causes for chronic wounds multiple treatment options available. Multidisciplinary approach is key, but the key is we need to find out what's causing the wound and address the problem at the source. And once we've addressed the problem, education and prevention are critical because if we don't educate our patients to uh, prevent them from having these wounds again, they will come back. And then finally, I would say, don't delay care especially in this day and age where everybody's very concerned about the care and concerned about problems, don't delay care. Speaking for Washington Hospital, we've taken a very early proactive approach. Um, the CEO at Washington Hospital, the medical staff, we've all worked in conjunction and we've, I think we've done a great job as far as making sure that the patients are safe, that the staff is safe and such. We test every patient that's being admitted or having a procedure. We screen everybody that's coming into the clinic, whether it's the outpatient clinic, the rehab clinic, or the wound clinic. In the wound clinic itself, we schedule patients that are high risk, such as patients coming from nursing home at the end of the day. And once they're done, that room gets closed. We don't use that room again. We clean every room on a daily basis so that we're minimizing 
the chance of any infection. And I can say, knock wood, that we have not had a infection or, or an outbreak from in the outpatient setting at Washington Hospital so far. And with all the things we're doing, I expect it to stay that way. Thank you. So we have some questions. Um, the first question that came through is, I am a diabetic and I get blisters on my foot from time to time. Sometimes they heal fast and other times they don't. How soon should I see a specialist when they're not healing? Um, as, as I mentioned, you know, our definition of a chronic wound is, is a wound that's been not healing for over six weeks. Now, typically, if there's a reason for the blister, oh, I hit my leg on something or what have you, then it's okay. But if it's a blister that hasn't healed in a week or two, or especially if you're a diabetic, if you notice your sugars are going up, it's a very easy telltale sign uh, in that your sugars are normally under pretty good control and all of a sudden they start to spike and they don't, don't want to seem to come down unless you go up on your insulin and go up on your medication. That means there's some kind of a stress on the body. So typically it's an infection or even an ulceration, things like that forming. A superficial wound tends to heal pretty quickly, but if it's anything that's going beyond that stage one or two that we were talking about, then you want to have it seen. And it may be initially even seeing your primary doctor, but for the wound clinic, we don't need a referral from the primary doctor. You can call the wound clinic and, and we can see you directly as well. Should I use water or an antiseptic solution to cleanse a wound? So I'm a big fan of keeping things simple. Um, soap and water kills 90 plus percent of, of bacteria, of everything else. So for the most part, I, I tell my patients use soap and water. It's rare that we'll use antiseptic or hydrogen peroxide or any of those things because they may be good in an infected wound. They may help in kind of cleaning up. But if the wound's not infected, they actually slow healing down because they can damage the fibroblasts, which is one of the cells that help with wound healing and things like that. So I usually recommend soap and water. I don't like for you to soak a wound in water. Running water is good. A shower, you know, washing your hands, things like that, or washing your feet, all that kind of stuff is okay. Pat it dry, and then depending on which dressing or ointment you're using, that's fine. How effective is vitamin E from preventing a scar? So once a wound is healed, the scar tissue doesn't make oil or sweat like normal skin does. So it tends to dry out much faster than normal skin. When it dries out, it can crack, break open, cause more scarring, things like that. So I tell my patients, you can use anything to keep the scar moist. Not wet, but moist. Um, I personally prefer any kind of lotion that's got vitamin E or aloe in it. Um, once the wound is healed, about a week after the wound is healed, any kind of lotion, a couple of times a day to kind of keep that area moist. Um, I'm usually not a fan of using direct vitamin E, so some patients will take a vitamin E capsule and poke a hole in it and put, the, put that in. I'm not a fan of that. About a quarter of the patients can have a reaction to it, so you can get like a rash and an irritation to it. So I'd rather keep something simple. Usually any kind of skin lotion, uh, Vaseline, Nivea, Cetaphil, not the petroleum jelly, because the petroleum jelly is occlusive and it doesn't allow the tissue to breathe, but the intensive care lotion for the Vaseline or Nivea, Cetaphil, Aveeno, you know, whichever one you have. Um, I usually recommend something that doesn't have perfumes because again, wound is uh, fragile, the skin is fragile, so we don't want to do anything that may irritate it, uh, but all of those work fine. In the majority of patients, the $50 scar cream and the $2 uh, Cetaphil work uh, pretty much equally. Okay. I have a chelate scar from an old injury. Can it be removed and how do I prevent it from happening again? So. A lot of the times what patients consider a keloid is not really a keloid. Um, it is a thickened scar or a hypertrophic scar. So the definition of a keloid scar is a scar that goes beyond the boundaries of the original cut, right? So if you remember the first or second slide that I talked about, there's a balance and that balance is broken. So if there's more scar growth, then the scar is growing beyond where it started and that's a keloid scar. A lot of times you see it in the ears and things like that. What people have is, okay, I have a cut around my elbow or around the joint, and because I've been moving my joint too much, that scar widens or it gets a little bit thick. And that's called a hypertrophic scar. So part of it is how the scar was closed. So if you close in multiple layers, so you're not putting all of the pressure on one layer, so if it's across the joint or across the area where there's a movement, that scar will tend to widen more often. 
Typically, if it's a true keloid scar, uh, we don't recommend cutting it out because if you cut it out, now you have a bigger scar where the original scar was and it still has the potential to become a keloid again. There are things that we can do such as uh, silicone sheeting, which is like this gel pad that we put over the scar or cortisone injections along the scar line, things like that, if it's a true keloid scar. If it's just a hypertrophic scar or a scar from a surgery that didn't heal properly or whatnot, a lot of times those you can cut out and, and make better, uh, again, depending on the location. Okay, this is our last question. How soon will the infected area heal after an amputation? So again, depends on a lot of factors, right? So if the circulation is adequate, if, the, if there's diabetes associated with it, kidney failure, any of these other things, those will tend to kind of slow healing down. Um, typically, again, depending on the location of the amputation, you can have an amputation at the level of the toes, at the bottom of the foot, above the, below the knee, above the knee, what have you. Right? Um, so if the wound is closed without tension, without infection, with adequate circulation, typically about two to three weeks it's healed. Um, if we're talking about a below knee or an above knee amputation, once it's healed, we need to allow for the swelling to come down before we can arrange for a prosthesis. So once the incision is healed, the stitches or staples are removed, we use what's called a stump sock, which is a little sock that puts pressure over that area to kind of squeeze out all of the extra fluid to allow that the, the extra fluid to get rid of, uh, to come out of that area. And once that has healed enough, then we can fit for a, a, a proper uh, prosthesis. Because if you put a prosthesis on when there's still swelling, eventually swelling goes away, then the prosthesis is loose, and, and then we have to start all over again. Well, this concludes our program for this evening. Thank you, Dr. Killaroo, for your expertise. And thank you to our viewers for tuning in. The entire broadcast of today's event will be available on our Facebook page. We look forward to hosting more Facebook Live events in the future.